Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan James, Assistant Director here at Bayless Library. Thank you for coming out on a night where the weather's not the best. Um, thank you, too, to Audrey Hutchison for coming and speaking to us tonight. We're very pleased, as I said, to have Audrey Hutchison here tonight. She's going to tell us about her new book, her second novel. Take your questions and then have her book available for purchase and signing. So please welcome Audrey. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Well, you know what my name is, and um, I'm glad you came. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm 74 years old, and when I was in college in 86 and 87, doing my associates, my um, well, let's see, what was she, composition instructor, said, you should be an author. I can't wait to read your papers. I said, when I get old, I'll be an author. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old now. I have six children. The oldest one is 49 and the old, and the, I mean, the youngest one is 49 and the oldest one is 55. So, you know, I was a busy mother and it took me a few years to get ready to go back to college. And that's when I did. And now I am back in college again because I want to learn more about creative writing. And my instructor, Jelena Rose, is here. Professor Jelena Rose, glad to see you. Now about the work book. I'd like to start by reading my dedication. This book is dedicated to many unfortunate people who suffer the maladies of schizophrenia and paranoia, and to their families who must agonize along with them. First of all, I have a prologue in the book that kind of gets you into the scene. On February 14th, 2002, Marlene Banker Van Sickles passed after a year of suffering physically. Her suffering was cancer. It had spread from her reproductive organs to her lower intestines, liver, and finally to her brain. Cancer for Marlene was the final illness. Her lifelong suffering started around her 18th year. Schizophrenia, the mental illness that plagued her life from that day on. Paranoia coupled with her schizophrenia caused her and her family a load of stress and unrest, not to mention the hell she went through. This is her story, okay. She was born in Detroit in 1936, and uh, she had a fairly normal life until she got to be about 18, 19 when she went to college. The family didn't notice anything that was unusual up until then. Um, she uh, came home from college and uh, was having trouble with her class, her roommates. And this, they could see, was a little, something a little different. A lot of times you have trouble with your roommates, but when you put salt in the sugar and cut the crotch of their underpants out, that's a little abnormal. Okay? Okay. So, the pre protagonist in this book is Marlene banker. She would be, that would be the main character. And the antagonist would be Jean, her sister. And um, although she had more than just the one sister, she had a younger sister and a younger brother, um, they were uh, not so close to her because of not being able to accept her illness. Uh, her brother, in fact, kind of turned his back and acted like there was nothing happening, but never became involved with her. Her younger sister became involved with so many shocking things in her life with her that she began to think she was insane, and so she was afraid of her. So therefore, her sister is the one that helped support her through her life. In this book, on page 284 and 85, she's written poems to Governor Engler. She always thought an awful lot of him. And his birthday, his 42nd birthday came up, 
and she wanted to write some poems. So she wrote two um, about Michigan. And I'll share one with you, Lake Michigan. Love letters in the sand of Lake Michigan, the land where my ancestors began. Amid towering pine trees and bluest of skies mirrored on those lakes, here sands of beaches beckon to them. They are kin who lo left Europe's downtrodden, the land where my ancestors began, sailed to a place called Port Hope, Michigan, where God shed his light on wooded slopes, and sailor cousins steered around this continent shaped like a mitten. My grandfather transported his life's possessions ready to till late bottom far lands. He cleared rocks and stones and trees to homestead the new frontier here in my Michigan. Here lies my history, my dreams and future plans. Rich is the land God provides for mortal man in the land of the Great Lakes where I write my own love letters in the sands of Lake Michigan. That was one of her very better poems. And Governor Engler was so pleased with these poems that he the back page of the very back page of the book, I have blackened her name out, but he wrote a thank you letter in script with the Michigan letterhead and everything. And I thought that was, we should share that with the readers just to realize that she was quite a gal. She was, she was like, and she loved people. But again, she had a darker side. So I'm going to read one of her poems when she was a little more unsure of herself. Betrayal. I saw myself gliding sil silently down a halo-lighted white hallway into a rectangular gallery where high shoots of golden light formed the colorless, cubistic prison. My invisible self stood looking over the shoulder of my white flowing garment as my eyes searched shadow forms on a white marble platform. As the white statues unfolded, I saw myself dressed in identical white garments. They turned slowly under bright lights as their eyes confronted me. I heard a high-pitched humming like telepathic wires or hissing snakes while I stood seized without legs, condemned by electrifying hatred in a multi-mirrored judgment. Wow. Your poems were good. Governor Engler was so pleased with her poems that he would send her a Christmas card from that day on. And I have all the cards, so later if you want to come up and look at them. Um, she had a high IQ. This is her attributes. She had a high IQ, very high. She was very attractive, built to perfection. And she was a perfectionist. She was rather uh, a socialite because she uh, became very involved with Governor Engler's campaign and went to his uh, uh, inaugural dinner and ball. She wrote poetry. She was an oil um, painter or artist, you might say. Um, she made some very beautiful art that the family all still keep and have it hanging on their walls. She had many good times with her sister. The one year when they were 13 and 15, they spent a whole day at Walpole Island. I, are you familiar with Walpole Island? Walpole Island is off maybe Algonac, Michigan. It's down in the lower part of the thumb. And you had to take a ferry to get across to it, a lot like Sugar Island. And over there, at one time, it was um, just the Native Americans, but when we went, there was very there were more uh, people that had settled there and everything, and so that day was full. We uh, uh, we uh, talked about the uh, what they did that day and everything. I uh, I talked with the sisters and and uh, they said that they had packed a picnic lunch, and the first first time they'd ever had it, they tried it was tuna fish sandwiches with uh, potato chips on it. And they, they never forgot that, or something they never forgot. But um, <clears throat> that was a good memory for the family to remember, and especially her sister. Marlene was very intelligent, as I said, and she decided to get in the spell down when she was only a freshman in high school, and she was competing with seniors as well. 
So it came down to the last, and that, that story's in the book, but I want to say she ended up being third in the county. And her opposition was the valedictorian and salutatorian that year uh, that graduated. So she, she, she was quite smart. Um, she, had, she was compassionate. She would take, uh, on leaner years, she would do something that was artistic or for one instance, she took her nephews, uh, she bought them new mittens and she put their initials, she sold the initials on them. So that they meant something. Those boys never forgot it. They told it over and over. Um, she was quite a good singer. She would sing and uh, not only alone, but with her sister as well. Another thing she did was apparently uh, had written to the Queen of England. I didn't know this. When she was dying, she asked me, tell my story. Please tell my story. She says, there's four boxes with journals and all the things I've saved, and that should be enough to tell the story. Well, here's this letter from Buckingham Palace in all of her collection. That too is up here. Uh, people that just buy a book in the store don't know all these things, but there it is, you can read it. Okay, there were times that were bad. She couldn't cope with the voices. She couldn't cope with her roommates. Um, her responses to the voices was negative. Um, when she was down, she hated those that loved her the most. At one time, she went through a marriage with Satan. Uh, done the ritualistic thing with the dark candles and the light ones and all that. She also done an oil painting, a full life-size uh, oil painting of Satan. When she was into institutionalized in um, Ypsilanti, she believed that she was raped by the um, male nurses. Whether she was or not, I don't know, but I found a lot of letters where she was pleading with those people in uh, Lansing that might be able to investigate those things and as a result of that <clears throat> Governor Engler did close down some of the institutions. The effects on her friends were very much like her older brother, her second older brother and um, the youngest sister. They become very few and distant because they didn't know how to accept what was happening to her. The effects on her employment, she started out as a professional teacher. She taught English and journalism. Uh, she, as, as you know, she was a published poet. But um, after a while, uh, people were aware that she had problems because there were times when she could, would lose work. And eventually she went to work for the state and she had problems again. And then she became a housekeeper and she had problems again. And then finally she was a home caregiver and she had problems again. So her work history went down to zero. Effects on the family, they were confused. They couldn't understand it, they were ashamed. Effects on herself, she lost her confidence she was unsure, she gained weight. She used to weigh maybe 120, 115. She gained weight, she was well over 200 pounds. She wanted to prove who she was. The book gets into details on that. Um, I can share a couple of her negative experiences. One was hilarious, but it was negative. She ordered pizza, got it home, it was still raw. She took it back down and threw it in the attendant's face. They called the police and she ran like Dickens all the way back home and hid from the helicopter lights that were shining all around the block. Hilarious. They didn't find her. She, found, she saw faces in the mirror. She would look at herself and see men, women, animals. Rather scary. One time when she went to an institution she believed that the Russians were getting her. She tried to buy a gun downtown Lansing 
and uh, they told her they couldn't have one and she pulled her pants down and said look at all these scars from them beating me and I need to have a gun to protect myself and they said we won't sell you one because you don't have a permit she turned the showcase over and she ended up in Ionia <clears throat> She got over these little things. I promised that uh, I wouldn't tell everything, but um, in time, uh, she realized that going to an institution was not exactly a positive thing for her life. And so therefore, she started mellowing down as her age became older, but she's still done some rather poignant things. And my understanding is that she went to a potluck and uh, brought spaghetti and she had little Debbie's ginger snaps all the way around it for trim. Well, uh, there was only one person that thought that was kind of strange and made some remark about it. But the really strange thing was when she put the mothballs in the crackers to keep them fresh. <laughs> <laughs> How she coped. When she was younger, she knew there was something not quite right and she'd become very addicted to alcohol. Uh, if there was a bottle of alcohol, she could always get happy. Well, her nieces and nephews thought she was hilarious. They loved her. She was always happy. But it wasn't the answer. They gave her meds, and when she was on them, she was fine. She was just as normal as you and I. And that is what can happen for anyone with schizophrenia. Uh, I read a little bit about it so I could understand things myself when I was writing this. They said one out of a hundred people have schizophrenia. Surprise. Um, she took her meds and then when she started feeling good, she went off of them. That's when things got bad. Eventually she started reading the Bible. She had a minister, she became ill, the minister came every day, and if he couldn't, the co-minister did. And they started studying the Bible and she became a Christian. This is shortly before she died. And this is the good part of the whole story. It was a blessing for her. I'm going to conclude by saying one thing. Was she misdiagnosed? Was she just a spoiled brat because she got her way so much when she was younger? And then I will say this, mental illness to me from what I've seen, is correlates with physical illness. You can have a hangnail, or you can have cancer. I think mental illness has its stages and levels, and I don't, for any reason, believe that you should shy away from a person if they are mentally ill. You should go with it. Okay, and I'm going to conclude my little <coughs> speech by saying one thing. Know that no one is silent, though many are not heard. So now I want to hear from you. Do you have questions? Did you find whether she had had any shock therapy? Because back in the 50s no. and 60s. They did do a lot of that. but I don't remember if I wrote that in there, but uh, the family did tell me that she, when she was institutionalized one time, that she went down in the basement and saw someone having this shock therapy and it made a believer out of her, believe me, she did not want that to happen. And uh, so uh, when the doctor said she needed to take pills, give me some. <laughs> I don't want to be shocked. How did you come to meet Ellen? So she came up here to visit, and I knew her from that time on. And did you write a... a Another novel? Yes, I wrote an, a novel prior to this, and it's called Corruption at Jamestown Prison. It, I have sold every last one, and um, it may have a second printing. The first, my first novel was full of typos. I mean, really full of them. And um, I was a little embarrassed because I trusted that my editor was doing his job and so therefore, my mistake, 
I didn't go back through and see what he did. So, but they, they all sold and everyone loved it, so. That's supposed to be in there because to protect your copyrights, if you have those errors, if somebody copies it and they still have the air in there, you know they've stolen them. <laughs> yeah. That's Thank what you. they recommend that they you. do is put some errors in. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so just saying you put the errors in, don't Sure. Do you know if there was anyone else in her family that, that had the marks of mental illness or who they thought maybe had been mentally ill? No, uh, one time they mentioned that um, her grandmother was um, rather spoiled, an only child, and she um, drank something to get her own way and she ended up in the hospital. But to me, we all do crazy things like yeah. that, you know, yeah, not, not to my knowledge. Yeah. They said it was a chemical imbalance in her brain that what causes those things? Imperfection. Mm -hmm. Right. Any more questions? And she had a daughter, did you say? She had one daughter. Uh huh. And she's in the book. Mm -hmm. Marianne. Do you still speak to Marianne? Marianne is not well. I'm almost thinking about doing a sequel if it's all right with the family. Um, she's not well, and she, um, just to give you a little idea, she, her husband died, and um, she was in the house alone, and someone went in there and beat her with a crowbar and robbed her. And when she, they left her for dead, and when she went at the hospital, they even tried to get in there, but it left her head caved in, and they tried to put a plate in there, and it would not uh, accept that, and um, it uh, slowly but surely her brain is deteriorated and she was her IQ was quite high also so she is now in a um, assisted living home uh, at a very young age 52 or something mm -hmm. but she was she was normal <laughs> all right she didn't have I think she was normal Mm -hmm. what I <laughs> <laughs> but what is normal after all? Especially after you spend time writing something like that, I'm sure you think, what is, what do we mean by normal? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. That's all I have. I normally talk longer than this. I talked for a good hour when I was up at Northern Michigan University. And um, of course I had 50 students that are asking me questions like crazy. Uh, it was all the psychology students up there oh. and of course they wanted to know everything from was she autistic to many many things you know and uh, you've mentioned meds and stuff did she ever do any kind of regular psychotherapy or counseling or anything that you know of? not to my knowledge hmm. and she didn't take any LSD at that age during that was that same time period too no no she was raised in a family that um, were Christian and so therefore uh, the scruples I mean she, she was a little bit um, promiscuous because she wanted to be uh, get her degree and she didn't want to be involved with a man and get married and have children so she was a little promiscuous she um, I'm not condoning that, uh, although I can understand what she was thinking, you know. Um, but uh, she was raised in a Christian family, and I don't recall, she's older than I was. So I can't remember any LSD in my age. So that was after I was around. 36, 50s. She'd be in college right in her 50s, mid-50s. Yes, 56 yeah. through 60. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good question, but I'm sure it never happened. Being a perfectionist, she always wanted to be in control. But being an alcoholic, she wasn't. Well, the alcoholism <laughs> and the mental illness seem to go together, though. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think your wife has a question, but she's still working it around <laughs> your brain. 
You have plans for a, a third book? Yes, my third novel is um, a murder mystery, and it is totally fiction. But the murder, the man who was murdered is Native American. So in this story, there will be a lot of um, their rituals, uh, the funeral, what they do at the funeral, uh, what led him to uh, possibly trust people, things like that. He, um, it's based on a kind of a, a, a life of a man that I knew, but he wasn't murdered. <laughs> so it's my imagination mainly. So that's, that's what I'm working on. And I won't have it finished until at least the spring of uh, 2014. So and how long did you work on this one? At least two years. The first one I worked on for 20 years because <laughs> I had an old beat up uh, computer and I had uh, something like eight chapters written and hit the wrong thing and didn't save any of it. And, but I did have some of it printed out. So I um, lost uh, the papers on that too. So I started all over again. And, um, and then another situation happened where I said, no, this isn't the way I want this written. So I started it all over again. And then finally, when I semi-retired and moved back up here, I lived in uh, Florida for 11 years. In 07, I actually started working on it. So really the finalization took me three years. And I put it out in the spring of 2010. So um, the compilation, uh, I'm learning a lot more now that I've decided to go back to, to college and learn the structure of building a book, uh, having your character, making sure the plot is all together in your head before you even start anything and do your research. And um, I am very thankful for both my uh, literature classes and uh, creative writing classes, I have um, Julie um, Barber and Juliana Rose both, and they've both been very helpful for me, and and I keep learning more and more. So I'm hoping the next no novel will be almost perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, it's really all I have. Okay.